Hi everybody, this is Nate from The Kramer Life. And Katie. Also from The Kramer Life. And today, we are joined by a very special guest. Everybody, this is Milton. And Milton, this is everybody. Nice to meet y'all. <laughs> First of all, tell me what you got, how many acres you got, how much grass you got, how much forest. Not much. <laughs> a lot. Uh, probably most of the grass is right here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we have 60 acres. Okay. It used to be farmed, but the previous owner owned it for about 20, 25 years and he let everything kind of just go to seed. He just liked, okay. he was a professor, he enjoyed watching nature not farming we're looking to reclaim it back into a workable homestead working farm okay uh, we do have animals on the homestead we have four pigs we have four lambs and we have about 20 chickens so okay. far so from a livestock standpoint what what is your ultimate goal in terms of what life, what types of livestock would you like to have I think we would like to continue with the animals that we have, uh, increase the swine, increase the lambs, okay. and then potentially add goats. Okay. Uh, we've talked back and forth about cows mm -hmm. uh, and dairy cows or meat yeah. cows, but it would be small scale. It wouldn't be large scale production. It would be mostly for our own consumption and our own use. With the pigs and the and the sheep, we're thinking maybe next season, next year, we might try to breed and sell, okay. but in a pretty small scale. It really just kind of pay for their feed and pay for their maintenance and operations and give us a little bit of, of um, profit. But we're not, we're not gonna do commercial farming. Okay. I mean, most of this right. is for you know, our own food, both the meat and then when we have our food plots and stuff. Yeah. Okay, so let's let's talk just a minute about marketing. Okay. Because marketing is really, really important. We can grow, whether it be livestock or a plant, almost anything right. where we're at here. But the issue is we can't always sell it. Mm -hmm. There's not always a good market. We don't have a good swine market here. Mm -hmm. We do have a livestock market that is attempting to start some small ruminant sales mm -hmm. for sheep and goats and possibly even some swine. But I would not rely on that as my only marketing alternative. So mm -hmm. let's look at adding value. And I'm all about anything we can do to what we're raising to make it worth more money, mm -hmm. that's what we need to do. Right. Uh, you know, somebody is buying that animal from you, they're doing something to it and they're getting paid for that service. You should get paid for that service. So what I would encourage you to do is start looking at a market for a finished product. Okay. Okay. Um, for instance, feed these pigs out, mm -hmm. uh, feed them out to slaughter weight, then harvest one for yourself, sell the other one to somebody out of the goodness of your heart, you're going to deliver it to the, the slaughterhouse. They're going to own it whenever it walks off the trailer to slaughterhouse. Mm -hmm. That way, you do not have to be labeled within the state of Tennessee uh, through the Tennessee Department of Agriculture, and it does not have to be USDA inspected unless you choose to do so or the person that you're uh, purchasing or person mm -hmm. that's purchasing from you chooses to do so. Okay. Um, and uh, it's not impossible to get that meat inspected. There are USDA inspectors that travel from different harvest facilities but you're kind of limited whenever you look at those USDA inspectors I as see. to when you can harvest. And when you're saying, uh, for the, back to the market, <clears throat> that there's not a big ruminant market yet, not a swine market. Uh, right. Mar uh, how, how far of a radius from this area are you talking? Are you talking all the way out to Knoxville? Or? Um, as far as a quote unquote commercial yeah. sheep and goat market, you're probably looking at Abington, Virginia oh, wow. to um, maybe as far as Middle Tennessee. Wow. Now that doesn't mean that there's not opportunities, but they're few and far between. Understood. If you can talk to individuals that want a pig to put in the freezer or a lamb to put in the freezer, sell those guys a live animal mm -hmm. that's ready to be slaughtered, harvested right then. I think that's the way you really maximize profits. And our marketing is it's all organic and they're, mm -hmm. you know, you can see we, we rotate our animals and, right. you know, they have fresh water, fresh grass, fresh, you know, 
lots and lots of leaves and debris and brambles. <laughs> poison ivy. And so much poison ivy. <laughs> one thing you might uh, you might kind of keep in, in the back of your mind as you're talking about things like organics. Yeah. To be certified organic mm -hmm. in the state of Tennessee is a big long process. Is it? Okay. But being all natural, okay. farm fresh, no hormones, those, that's easy to do. But okay. to be certified organic is a, a process okay. that gotcha. you have to go through. Okay. So, you know, kind of kind of be clear on your words. marketing. You, right. you may <laughs> want to stop before you get all the way to that word of organic. You can do everything that you would do in organic. Right. But unless you have a certification, you really can't call it organic. Totally understand. Officially. Yeah, yep. that makes sense. Your your whole key to making your marketing plan work of adding value to these animals is making sure that we get these animals finished correctly. Mm -hmm. Because not all the time are you marketing to folks that totally understand the process. Right. Okay? Mm -hmm. So if we have an animal that we're going to market to somebody, they're expecting some level of eating satisfaction. Right. We want to make sure we're at that level or above, mm -hmm. which means that we've got to properly finish those animals. Mm -hmm. um, I constantly see animals going to harvest, uh, especially in the cattle end of things, you know, where you get a steer calf that's going to finish out about 1,250, 1,300 pounds with a quarter of an inch of back fat on his back and you see a 700 pound calf that has no back fat. Mm. And that eating experience is not what that person expects. Right. <laughs> so, and you only get one shot, Right. you know. Once that person has a bad experience, they're not gonna do it again. I would start out by trying to develop that market with people that I know, that mm -hmm. I can sit down and have those conversations with, as opposed to somebody I don't know. Yeah. Right, mm -hmm. and then build word of mouth. Right. Because we have other ideas and other plans outside of animals of what we'd mm -hmm. like to do here. Uh, I would, I'm interested in uh, a flower farming as okay. well. And then we also wanna have an orchard and so okay. when we when we talk this first 10 acres up front it right now mm -hmm. it's the majority it's going to be cedar and pine right is what's up there and we're looking to clear cut some of it yes because we want to put an orchard up there because we have an existing pond that we want to reseal because it's leaking and it doesn't hold water but right. we want to have kind of a whole ecosystem there with the ducks and you know the put the different animals rotating through it and then the orchard as well so we can talk about that too and see if you agree kind of with what we're okay. thinking in that area um, and then we also have uh, once we start heading back <laughs> into the larger part of the property that's where you can very easily see what used to be pasture and we think that's mm -hmm. going to be where we probably want to put our garden and our more permanent crops in that area okay. as well one thing that you might look at <clears throat> and again since you're looking long term is uh as you clean some of this out where we're actually seeing some of these species that basically regardless of age are not going to get real valuable you may clean out larger areas and then just plant trees back. Mm -hmm. um, Forestry Service has got several different programs that they will help you with in okay. terms of planting species, that type of thing. And just like we were talking about up there, making sure that, that we've got something that's gonna be 30 years down the pike, a payoff, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I think we'd be interested in that and just cleaning it up and and planning what makes sense. Well, you know, you got cedars, you got pines, We've you got, got elms. We've got a ton of poplar in the back. We've got about 25 acres of poplar. And, and poplar, good marketable timber. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you could be growing black walnut, mm -hmm. uh, oaks, things like that in places or basically you're growing trees that have no value now or at any time in the future. I mean, this looks like this used to be field yep. that is now yeah, just sure is. just grown up. We were thinking, come in here with a, a, a mulcher, just a forestry mulcher and just mow it down. 
one way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you have that. That's one way look. <laughs> yeah. I don't, that certainly would work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. With me, ain't problem at all. And on these stumps, if you can, you can grind them down that far into the the soil, and then smooth up on top of them, then the stumps would be out of your way. Mm -hmm. So, what what way would you do it if if you were in charge here? Well, I kind of like that idea, <laughs> um, but you know, I guess the more traditional way to do it would just be to come in with a dozer and push those trees out. But then, of course, you got got to do something with the trees that you push out. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, if they and, and of course. Like that's a black walnut, and you've got a couple of saw logs in it. Yeah. Yeah. That one over there he is, and you got a couple of saw logs. Yeah. So yeah. there's some of those you'd want to probably cut keep. some timber out. Or we'd just keep them for now yeah. and clear around them. Because we do like silvo pasture as well, where yeah. we would now, keep... The only thing about the, the walnuts is that typically, whenever you get rid of the competition that's already around them, they will tend to kind of keep things from growing underneath them. They kind of, oh. they don't have a natural herbicide per se, but they do have some chemical presence in the soil that will, okay. you know, so that keep trees from growing right around crop. them. That includes any crop stuff, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. And, and the shade, you know, mm -hmm. if you were wanting to plant a garden, you would not want these trees shading your garden. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you, you may have an area out there that's big enough for a garden and then yeah. a little thicket. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but certainly these little pines and things, as long as the slope doesn't get too bad, mm -hmm. yeah, I'd mulch those suckers up. Mm -hmm. So cedar, lots mm -hmm. and lots of cedar on this property. Is there, is there any value outside of this property for cedar? I mean, we can use it for fence posts and building and whatever. Well, and the issues you run into, like this cedar here, if you've ever cut a cedar, you know it's got a red center yeah. and white around the outside. Well, white rots, red doesn't. So if you cut this one down, he's probably got a red spot about that big in the middle. Mm -hmm. So all that white's going to rot off. Oh. So the ones that have grown under a lot of stress, and if you look, that one's been growing in the side of a road mm -hmm. for years and years. He's probably got more red in than this one does. Mm -hmm. And if you can find big cedars, you can actually saw those and people like to line closets with them yeah. because it's, you know, it's naturally offensive to malls right. and things like that. Right. It smells good. And they make tabletops and sure. all that kind of stuff, yeah. Yeah, so cedars like this, little value. Some of the bigger cedars, especially those without a lot of limbs down low, they're going to be more valuable to you. You said without the limbs down below? Without. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can see the creases and where the limbs come out. Whenever you saw that, there's going to be streaks and holes on okay. the boards. I see. Which, from a rustic standpoint, is great. Uh -huh. but Depends on your buyer. Right. Okay. There are... Uh, there are several folks around that's got little band saw mills. And I guess what I'd probably do if I were you is I cleaned up, I would just collect these logs and just strategically locate them in places and group them up. And then periodically I'd have somebody come in and saw those. Maybe you got your barn fixed to where you can stack and stick that lumber in there and let it dry, you know, and keep it under cover. Mm -hmm. That type of thing. Do you have any idea what this building would have been for? There's an entrance on the other side to the top. We don't recommend the stairs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Um. I mean, it's, it looks like a somewhat newer style foundation. I'm going to bet it. this had something to do with the uh, mill because this looks like a door to load stuff out of. Uh, and it appears like you could drive on the upper side of it as well. Yeah. I believe so, yeah. So I'm going to bet 
that may be that may be where they stored things like meal, flour, feed, that kind of thing maybe. Wow, okay. Because it's it's been bored and battened, so it's been sealed up pretty tight from the elements. Oh, yeah, yeah I, I'm, I'm going to bet that that's been maybe where they sold product from the mill. Because huh. I, I feel pretty certain that either there or up here, one of the two, was probably a county road at one time, more than likely. Wow. You find those everywhere. Uh, on my farm, there's four or five roads. Oh, wow. Uh, I think more than likely the road used to be there at one time, like I think a wagon so. road. I think so. Oh, a wagon road. Yeah. What, what makes you think it's a wagon road? Just well, typically you find these roads around through the woods that are like that. They haven't been used for years, so we know it's not a waterway. Uh, it looks like road banks. It's got trees in it that obviously are 50, 60, 70 years old, some of them and uh, it's just been worn down and whenever folks travel by wagon they went the not always the easiest but the shortest distance mm -hmm. and they just kept going and that was a road wow. you know that's so, so it wasn't like cool. hey uh, we need to build a road and follow this property line yeah they yeah. just drove the easiest way to get there so speaking of invasive trees mm -hmm. are there programs available to landowners for help, help with invasive uh, that you know of? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Um, this is a relic from the yard. That's what it is. Yeah. They produce little blueberries. Birds eat them and everywhere the bird sits on the post. Yep. But like this tree, it's been planted. That's not, you know, that's a white pine. We don't normally find those just indigenous. Mm. But that's been planted as part of the landscaping in the yard. Mm. And we got something that's blooming over here yep. that's most likely from the yard. I would say that one time the yard probably came this direction a lot more than it does. Now. Yeah. Yeah, that's primrose. Primrose, okay. Yeah. Lots of berries in here. Yep, you don't have lots of blackberries. This tree here, this is a naturally occurring tree, this wild cherry. Mm. And it is extremely toxic whenever it's wilted. Mm. So uh, your sheep, your goats, your cattle, pigs, any of that, make yeah. sure that they can't get to that. And we're talking about a handful of leaves will kill a 1,200-pound cow. Oh my goodness, wow. Yeah, it doesn't take a lot. Wow. Yet, but this is kind of the vicinity of which we were thinking orchard flower farm berries having all of that kind of between where you entered the property mm -hmm. and here and here kind of it's about 10 acres why you know area and have this as your marketing venue here we could yeah i was just thinking here you could actually in the fall of the year, if you got an apple crop, uh, pumpkins, mm -hmm. gourds, that type of thing, yep. and you could actually have this as a retail area, mm -hmm. have it decorated, and uh, you could offer hay rides, pick your own pumpkin, have roads around through the property that you take kids on hay rides. So if you want to go agritainment, just do everything you can possibly do because the the liability insurance is going to be the same. Got it. And it's going to be way too expensive, but it's... You just do one thing. You got to have it. Yep. So, uh, you know, I'd, I'd do everything I could, and I'd, I'd think about making this a, a retail, having the entrance that's different than the entrance into your house. Yep. So that people could drive up without going around by the house. Yep. So from the extension office standpoint, are there other resources that we should know about, that you can tell us about, that we should further look into that would be beneficial to us? Yes. There is a program through the Tennessee Department of Agriculture called Tennessee Agricultural Enhancement Program. Okay. And uh, we commonly call it TAEP. 
And in that, what it is, it's a cost share program. You uh, sign up one week out of the year, October the 1st through the 7th. And there are different categories that you can sign up for. There are things like uh, livestock, fruit and vegetable, agritainment, uh, hay storage, machinery, those kinds of things. They won't pay on a tractor. <laughs> Before you ask that. Uh, the, uh, oh, what do they call it? Diversification grant. Uh, the diversification part of it is probably what I would be interested in if I were in your shoes because that will help you if you want to turn this into an agritainment it can help you put in things like coolers oh, for storage wow. it can help you put in restroom facilities, hand washing facilities oh, wow. all those kinds of things um, like I said you can only apply one week out of the year Okay. But uh, and, and you only apply to one of those programs? One one section. One, one yes. section per year. Okay. What what you can do, you can do a Google search for T A E P. Yes, sir. And you will find the application materials for 2021. Okay. And I don't expect a whole lot's gonna change. Okay. So I I feel pretty confident in saying that. The 2022 program is going to look a lot like the 2021. Yeah. Oh, wow, that's great. I think some level of machinery should be high on your list. Okay. okay? Now, um, we should just start with that. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm a realist. If you can buy a used vehicle, uh, you know, used tractor, mm -hmm. that will work for what you need and buy it reasonable then I think that's you know uh, 99% of the farmers are farming with machinery that's 10 years old and older anyway so yeah. um, the, the, I guess the, the thought I have on that one and you can tell me how I'm wrong when I'm on Facebook marketplace and I'm looking at a tractor that's 20 years old with 15 to 3,000 hours which I know is little and fine Mm -hmm. It's the same price as a brand new tractor yep. at Kubota. Yeah. Uh, just like how? And, and that, uh, you know, that's not the kind of tractor that you need to be finding. Right. You know, you, there needs to be a significant price difference or buy the one that's got a warranty on it, yeah, you know? exactly. Absolutely. Now, uh, a lot of these diesel tractors, the older ones, of course, didn't use death. So, you know, you've got an added expense to run and it's not super significant in your situation because you're not running them. 12 hours a day, six yeah. days a week. Yeah. You don't need four wheel drive. Uh -huh. um, my theory on that is in a situation like yours, if you're in a place where you need four wheel drive, you're in a place that you don't need to be. <laughs> um, I, I would forego the four wheel drive and make sure I had a front end loader. Sure. Uh, because the loader's going to be handy about carrying, pushing, um, clearing, that kind of thing. Yeah, I wanted to get a loader and a grapple. Yep, a grapple is nice. Uh, uh, I know it's I, not needed, but it's. I couldn't live theory. without my loaders. I've got three tractors with loaders on them. Uh, I couldn't live without them. Um, and I'd like to have a grapple. And if I run on one worth of money, I'll own one, you know. Uh, it's on my like to have, but don't have to have list. Yeah. And you'll you'll find that you'll have those lists. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was just thinking but, with the grapple with all of the stuff that we're going to be pushing down. To mm -hmm. and, Pick it and up and carry of, it. All of yep. the, the vines and everything just grab yep. and Yep, you can shred a lot of stuff out with yeah. that. Yeah. So I, I think you have a bigger need for it than I do. Yeah. Right. So it, it would probably in your situation it ought to be on the I gotta have list instead I, of the I'd like, I like to have you. list. I like you hear that? You hear what he said? <laughs> I am not the hold up here with the tractor situation, <laughs> just to be clear. <laughs> but um, tractor and a bush hog, I'd probably buy a new bush hog okay. because most of your six, seven foot bush hogs, they're going to be just more tea totally out. I see. So okay. you're going to get in some of this heavy stuff and get on the stump or something and rip a gearbox out and, and you know. So probably bush hog, that's a piece of equipment that gets a lot of abuse. So I think 
that a new one probably makes sense there. Now from a standpoint of tillage, things like that, you could have a, a turn and plow and a disc and a subsoiler and you can buy all those used or you can buy a tiller to go on your tractor where you just say that's like a garden tiller but it's like garden tiller on steroids for the back of your tractor and you could till up garden spots, flower spots, uh, that type of thing. You probably need a post hole digger whenever you start to plant trees. It's going to make life a lot easier. And if you're building permanent fences and things like that as well. So, yeah. So, you know, the list of equipment is fairly short, really. Um, you know, you're going to need hay for your, your animals, that type of thing. But uh, don't try to raise it yourself. Buy it. You're not going to need that much. So much out here just to buy it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you're not talking about needing a huge amount. So it makes no sense at all for you to own any kind of a harvest equipment at this point. In time. Correct. Plus, yeah. there's no hay field right. space for us. <laughs> so we have a little work to do before yeah. we get to that point. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm thinking, you know, the tractor, a loader. To me, a loader is just a, a must have. And the bush hog, and then there are some other things that you'd like to have. Uh, like the tiller and that kind of thing, but you know you really need a tractor pretty soon. Yeah, I know. But you don't have to have a tiller till next spring, sure. So you know you can space some of this stuff out. Yeah. From an animal standpoint, I think you've got things under control right now until you decide to enter that mode of less breeds and pigs, mm -hmm. um, because one of the things that you're going to have to consider. And, and I know it may be a sore point, and sometimes it's a sore point with me as well. Um, pig survivability on pastured pigs is not good. Mm -hmm. It's not good. That's the reason that we farrow sows in a crate and keep them in a crate for a week or 10 days is because they have absolutely no sense of personal safety for a, right. a pig and they'll lay on them, they'll suffocate them, they'll crush them. Yep. Some of them will even eat them. Yep. So. I remember this, my, my yeah. grandpa had, like I said, over so, 300. Yeah, and a lot of people have big issues with farrowing crates, but the farrowing crate actually is for the safety of that young pig. Mm -hmm. And that sow does not stay in that farrowing crate all her life. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, your, your success rate's going to be compromised if you fire a pigs just out here on the ground. Okay. So with that in mind, you either say, okay, I'm going to suffer those losses, or I don't want to suffer those losses, and we've got to have some sort of a facility. Now, we don't need a big fancy climate control fire in the house, but we need somewhere that we can fire some sows. You know and get those pigs up big enough where they can kind of take care of themselves, get out of the way, kind right. of thing. Yeah. So, uh, any, any uh, advice on sheep? On the sheep, if you're going to do breeding, uh, you will need some uh, lambing jugs, which is basically just small pens. But that can be just a lean-to shed out here, you know, big enough for you to walk in. And, and to have a few little pens, maybe six by six or eight by eight, just so that that ewe is up. She's safe from predators. She's where you can go check her every couple of hours, you know, until those lambs get there. Um, probably need to be able to get power to it. Doesn't necessarily have to have power in it all the time, but you can stretch in an extension cord so you can put a heat lamp out there if you need to. That kind of thing. So, she decides to pick the coldest time of the year to have her baby. Yeah, usually. Mm -hmm. uh, snow on. Yep. <laughs> Nasty. They're kin to cows. Yep. <laughs> yeah, they're little cows. But um, the, the infrastructure for reproduction on the lambs is going to be a lot simpler than it is for the pigs. But I do have plans for all of those at the office. Oh, okay. okay. And, and we've got a program called the Manage Program, the Farm Manage Program. And as you get started, from a financial analysis standpoint, those guys can come out and help you out. And what they'll do, they'll actually build what they call a FIMPAC program, financial management program. 
and they'll say, okay, if we're looking at this based on national figures mm -hmm. under this level of management, here's what we'd expect the end result to look like. Okay. Now, is it going to be exactly right? Yeah. But it's going to be really close. Mm -hmm. And you may be thinking, okay, well, I'm thinking a little bit about adding five freezer beef a year mm -hmm. into my operation, you know, into my animal side of things. And uh, they can come out, sit down at your kitchen table, plug that in, put the budgets in, and they can say, okay, we'd expect this change to occur, okay. this amount of change, you know, and sometimes it's the added expense that it takes to get that up and going is not offset by the additional income, and you need to know that up front. Right. Um, same thing with the planning and the things, you know, yep. hey, I want to add, I want to add cut flowers, I want to add uh, hours and day lilies, mm -hmm. you know, that type of thing. They can do the same thing. I want to do five acres of orchard. Yeah. That's going to be an upfront cost. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we, we talked a little bit about that. I'd probably stick to the tree fruits. The, the apples, I think those work. Um, yeah, it's just pretty hard to beat apples in this part of the world. Yeah. And uh, we have such a wide variety of, of species available to us. You know, you can have apples as early as June, mm -hmm. late June, and you can have apples all the way through the 1st of November. Yep. So okay. whenever you plant, you want to kind of keep that in mind yep. so that you get apples coming in all the time. Yep. So if you got people coming to get apples, and people will drive from here in town all the way, you know, 60 miles down here to the mountains to get apples. Yep. Well, you you a whole lot closer, yep. you know, so if you've got an orchard and you can sell apples, they're going to stop here. Oh. So while you're here, you know, in October, pick up your pumpkins, and mm -hmm. pick up your gourds. Yep. Maybe you plant a little bit of uh, Hickory King corn out here so that you get really tall corn. You don't care what kind of ear it's got on it because you're going to cut it and put six stalks in a bundle. Get a bale of straw. That'd be pretty. Two pumpkins, a cushion, a long necked gourd, 25 bucks. Here's your Halloween decorations. Got it. You know, package deal. Yep. And don't forget your bush of apples on the way. Right. Mm -hmm. So, yep. you, know, you can always. You can always do that, and you know, you can plant a little quarter acre plot of corn out here. The coons are going to tear it all to pieces and they're going to eat all the corn off of it, but it doesn't matter because you're after the potter. Yeah. 